It is good to be here with you guys this morning. Um, if you are new here, my name is Brett. I'm the pastor of Intercultural Ministries. Um, and I just want to welcome you guys all here this morning. Um, so if you noticed last week, there was a big gap right around this area. Um, our youth was on a trip, a mission trip over in Chicago. Yeah. That gives you a feel for how the week was. Um, yeah, they were in Chicago. We were serving with uh, Envision Chicago, a partner in the Christian Missionary Alliance. Um, so we got back at like nine last night after 12 hours of travel, um, driving from Chicago. So if James or me or any of the youth seem a little delusional, it's because we are. Um, but yeah, <laughs> the youth are not. Um, anyways, we had a great week getting to serve the community there, um, getting to really step into walking with the spirit. Um, we had some really good teaching and training. Um, so it was a good week of both being filled up and learning and growing, but also investing and learning how to pour out in the community there. So yeah, it was a great time. Thank you guys so much for praying for us, for giving, for supporting this team as they went out there. Um, and we're actually going to be sharing on August 11th, so not next Sunday, but the Sunday after that. Um, just sharing about the trip. You'll get to hear a little bit more about what God did in, in the team and through the team. So I encourage you guys, come out on Sunday night, um, August 11th, to hear a little bit more um, about what God did. Um, also, this upcoming Friday, August 2nd, uh, there's going to be a men's barbecue. Yeah, yeah. Where's, the, where's the cheering yeah. for that? <laughs> um, so this will be at uh, the Steins house. Pastor Dwayne and Sue um, are hosting. So August 2nd, 6 to 9. This is just a chance to connect, spend some time together, eat really good food. Um, and if you are planning on coming, interested in coming, please sign up um, online so Dwayne knows how many people to prepare for. Um, but yeah, that is up on the church website. encourage you guys to come out to that. Um, also, just a, a note next week, uh, the O'Connors are actually going to be sharing on Sunday evening. Um, so they'll be sharing a little bit in the morning, but at 7 p.m. here, they're going to be sharing a little bit more, a little bit deeper about what their years looked like, ministry. So I encourage you guys to come out um, as we're supporting them and praying for them. We get to actually hear what they're doing um, and what God is doing this night. So yeah, I encourage you guys to come out to that. Um, also, just as a, as a reminder, um, thank you guys for your giving, your generosity, supporting the mission of what God is doing here in Mechanicsburg and around the world, in Chicago, all over the place, through the mission of Emmanuel Church, through what God is doing here. Um, and just a reminder, if you want to give, there's a box back there to give, or you can give online on our website. James is displaying the box. So, yeah, thank you guys. And turn it over to the worship team. All right, we invite you to stand with us as we worship the Lord together this morning.
Lord Jesus, we come before you. And Lord, we turn our attention to you. Lord, we ask that you would unveil our eyes, Jesus. Lord, as a people, we want to see you this morning. We want to experience you in a new and a tangible way. So God, this morning, would you come in power? Would you come in might? And Lord, would you speak to your children? Lord, that is the prayer of our hearts. Lord, Hebrews 12, 2 says, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. This is who we worship this morning, King Jesus. So Lord, this morning, would you come and would you have your way in this place, Jesus? We worship you. We give you praise and glory and honor. We lift up your name, Jesus. Amen. Show us, show us your glory. Show us, show us your power. Show us, show us your glory, Lord. Let's make that the prayer of our hearts. Lord, come and show us. Show us, show us your glory, show us, show us your power, show us, show us your glory, Thank you. 
of your majesty, and I will meditate on your wonderful works. They tell of the power of your awesome works, and I will proclaim your great deeds. They celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. All your works praise you, Lord. Your faithful people extol you. 
They will tell of the glory of your kingdom and speak of your might so that all people may know of your mighty acts and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures through all generations. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Amen. From heaven's throne, Portugal, 
worshiped as we read your word, worshiped as we conclude this morning, because you are worthy. You are worthy of it all, Jesus. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I'd like to invite the Portugal team to come on up front here. You know who you are. Don't be bashful. Allison Patton, don't be bashful. Celinda, let her go. She needs to come up here. I tell you. Hey, we're getting ready to, we just received back, and we're going to hear great stories from our youth trip. The youth team had just went to Chicago, and now there's going to be another team leaving here this week. These wonderful ladies here are going to be heading off to Portugal, uh, another missions trip that happens every year. Uh, this has been so exciting. Um, I have a microphone for you, Allie, for right now. So um, before we uh, commission them, I just want to get some information about what they're going to be doing so you can understand and virtually and you know, kind of go with them. Uh, on this trip, because as we send them out as a team from Emmanuel, we're sending them not to just go on your own, but to go fully in our support and, and uh, us going with you. So um, Portugal, this is cool. You guys do this every year. So Ali, you're, you've been leading a trip. You started, I think, the, the thing way back when. when. When was that? 2015, and that was Jan Dormer. She used to oh, come yeah. here, and she was a, a TESOL. Is she still... <laughs> okay, she was a a TESOL, a world renowned TESOL professor that worked at Messiah. And she invited me to go with her and Patricia to go with her. So it all started in 2015, and we Emmanuel has sent a team every year except for COVID. Yeah, yeah. due to COVID, COVID. Emmanuel has sent. Someday we're not going to use that excuse anymore. You know, right? Not going to paraphrase yeah. everything by saying COVID. Yeah. So yes. So um, I'm not sure everybody knows, you, probably every, most of you know everybody, but let's just real quickly introduce, you want to introduce your team? May I pass it down for them to? Oh, sure, you can do that. <laughs> I'm Allison Patton. I'm Mandy Stein. Stacy Weaver. Carrie Kunkel. Grace Kunkel. Emma Patton. Thank you. So... Again, so some people don't know what you guys do on this trip. Can you just give us a quick rundown of you're going on a trip to do something specific. Um, so let's hear what that is first. Then I want to hear a little bit more about the why we would do that. And you might have part of that in there too. Go ahead. We go with a group called Teach Beyond, um, and it's, a international, it's an international group education um, ministry, and they go with the, we just read a PowerPoint about it, so if I forget one, just jump in. We go with humility, we go to serve, and we go to educate. educate. And one of the things that um, the world wants is to learn American English, not British English, but American English. So Teach Beyond has um, schools and camps uh, worldwide, and we have, our heart's desire has taken us to, to Portugal, and Portugal is different than any other Teach Beyond camp. It's um, a workshop related, it's conversational, it's relational. So we have fallen in love with that country and, and those people, and um, each one of us will be part of a, a workshop, leading a workshop or part of a workshop. That's awesome. Um, so I love the fact you guys go, and it's got to be just a cool experience to be in Portugal. But why? I mean, yeah, you can teach people, but why? What's, what's special about this camp that, that, that makes it that you want to go to this again? I would like all of uh, <laughs> the ones returning to chime in and say, say what, if that's okay with you. If you do it quickly. Do it quickly, <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. Because um, each one of our hearts is the same but unique. Um, I have, I go because um, the Lord asked, the Lord asked, and I learned a long time ago that when you say yes, because there's times when I've said no, but when I say yes, um, the blessings that he gives me, it, when I let him use me someplace else, the blessing that I receive is just over, overwhelming, and um, we have fallen in love with the campers and the mm -hmm. Portuguese, and um, Portugal, Portugal is a point, I think this is right, 0.1% evangelical. 
So it's, um, it's not a black country or dark country, but it's a gray one. Mm -hmm. uh, so we go to tell them, provide a service that they want, which is to learn English, and through that we are allowed to present the gospel to them. And it's not hidden. It's part of their um, advertising for the camp, that it's an English camp, but it's also biblically based. Okay, can I? That's good. That's good. Oh, yeah, oh, one more. Okay. Just to, I will say, these kids, a lot of them come from not good backgrounds. And culturally, because it's so little percentage evangelical, taking the love of Jesus and let them know, no matter what their family dynamic is, what they're hearing from the government, what they're hearing from their schools, we can show them the light and love of Jesus that they need so badly. And that's what we've been singing about all morning. I mean, the, there's no other name. No name higher than the name of Jesus. So although you guys get to go and you get to meet people and you get to see cool things, you get to take the name of Jesus with you. What a beautiful thing. Um, so, Allie, you've been there before. Mandy, you've been there a number of times before. Stacy, you've been there a number of times before. Emma's been there a number of times before. But Grace and Carrie have not been. So, <laughs> Carrie, as somebody who's going for the first time, on your first mission trip, what's on your heart? Just share a little bit with us about what's on your heart about leaving this week to get on a plane, fly to Portugal, and interact with a bunch of people you don't know, don't speak your language, all that good stuff. So, In 30 seconds or less. We heard about English camp for many years, but there was something in being a part of planning for this trip and recognizing that we're going to sleep away camp. This is like a week of sleepaway camp. So there's kids you don't know, there's a talent show, there's outings, um, the food that's prepared in the cafeteria. There's all of those elements of going into that kind of an environment. So you're excited and you're a little bit anxious and there's a lot that you just don't know. But we've seen God work so faithfully already in preparing for the trip. And so it's really cool to know that we can just step out in faith and follow that whatever we don't know, he has. And he's already there, and he's already prepared it. So it's just a really cool and slightly anxiety-inducing experience. That's awesome. Thank you. I'm going to have all of you guys step down here to the main uh, platform, the main floor. And you're, you have one more thing to say. Yep. Um, and I want to have family and elders, family, friends, you want to pray over these? We're going to pray over these, uh, all of them as they leave here, as we commission them out. But I want the elders to come up now. I want family and friends to come up and gather around them um, as we get ready to pray. Ali, I just want you to share one more thing with the, with the church. And just, we want to go with you. Uh, what's that feel like from your perspective uh, to have the church going with you on this trip? I... I think I speak for all of us here. We are deeply grateful and deeply humbled. And um, every year you, you faithfully send us. And we are humbled and grateful. And we take you with us. And we're just your representatives. So thank you. We're going to lay hands on all these that are going. And we're going to send you guys off as part of Emmanuel Church. As a church congregation, if you're not standing up front here, just pray over us as we pray with this, for this team. Father God, this is a true blessing to be able to see a team like this that you've assembled for such a time as this. Lord, you've taken these six, you've put them together, you prepared them to go as representatives of Emmanuel Church, and more importantly yet, representatives of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, to a dark world, to, a, to people who don't know you and don't know what it's like to experience the joy and the love and the peace that comes only through you, Jesus. So, Lord, I pray as we send them out, Lord, that you would do an amazing work you do, your, do what you do best. You provide a hand of protection. You provide uh, ev all that's needed. You provide the strength that's needed. You provide the words. You provide everything that they're going to need along the way. And we are counting on that, God. We are resting in that. 
But Lord, we are praying that Holy Spirit, you are already there. You're already working in the lives of these kids that are coming, these students and other leaders that will be there. You are already opening doors. You're already providing questions that they're going to ask that's going to open a door and a window to hear about Jesus. So Jesus, we pray for your transformation power to be, do a mighty work among those in Portugal and these Americans as they're in Portugal. <laughs> Lord, you do a mighty work across the board, we pray. Lord, we send them out in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit, on behalf of Emmanuel Church. Lord, asking that thy will be accomplished in and through this team. In the powerful, mighty, and matchless name of Jesus Christ, we pray this. Amen. So last week, we waded into a topic of much interest and much discussion here on a beautiful July summer. We're talking about the Antichrist. I don't know if anyone's going to like say that for me, like get it out there. Yeah, We're talking about the Antichrist. And, and a lot changes in a week, if you think about it. Uh, since last week, you know, the Olympics started. We changed presidential candidates. Our Chicago missions team came back. Many of you were away on trips or vacations and, and have come back. And, and uh, so here we are. We're going to step into this this morning again. Uh, if you weren't with us, I encourage you to go back and listen online uh, because last week's message is on the same exact verses we're about to read, but it's through the lens of the who and the what of the Antichrist. Not like who is in can we name the person? We don't know who that will be uh, yet. Uh, but what, a, what, what, will, what will he be like? And what will he do? And then today is more on what's the future of the Antichrist and, and those related to the story of what's going to happen. So I'm actually going to orient this message around four questions of, of what's the future of four key players in this story uh, as we uh, conclude this set of 12 verses. And and I'm looking forward to opening it up so far. In fact, uh, this past week, many of you had um, a lot of conversations among each other, conversations with me, uh, questions about uh, this prophecy or this prophecy, and, and a whole lot of I don't knows uh, in response, because there's a lot of this we can't have fully figured out. Um, so far, no hate mail. That's an accomplishment uh, right there, <laughs> hoping for the same result this week. Um, but... Um, just by way of recap, let me explain why this is even coming up in 2 Thessalonians. The Apostle Paul wrote this letter. He wrote it to a, a city called Thessalonica 2,000 years ago. And there were people coming to this little church that had just been planted. It's only a year old. And they were coming around after Paul had already left. And, and they're saying, hey, guess what? Jesus has already returned. You guys missed the boat. And sorry, you've been left behind. And the Apostle Paul hears about this from hundreds of miles away and, and writes this letter and says, no, 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 that, that didn't happen. In fact, you guys are okay. There are some clear and obvious things that have to happen in, order, uh, in the order of events before Jesus will come back. In fact, I'm going to write about some of these things to you. And, and that's what we're about to read. And he unpacks this idea of the, the man of lawlessness uh, is what he's called in here, which is also known then as the Antichrist. And, and by way of review, let me just talk about the, this term Antichrist. It comes up in, in the book of 1 John a couple of times and a few other places in, in Scripture. And this is what the term means. Antichrist means against Christ or in place of Christ. The Antichrist will be Satan's substitute for being the king, the Messiah, the savior of the world. And, he, and he's going to use all kinds of, of uh, power and tricks and lies and manipulations and, and, and truly satanic power uh, to be able to sway people uh, to believe that he is the one that they should trust in, the one that they should worship. In fact, he's going to proclaim himself to be God and, and the world is going to follow after him. Not all the world, but a majority of the world will follow after 
him. And so uh, we're going to kind of look into what, what will that lead to? What kind of mess will that create? Because it will create a big mess. And so let's read 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 1 through 12. Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, let me just pause a second, that was one of his topics in the previous letter in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, that there's going to be a rapture, a gathering up to Christ in the air when he comes back. I can't wait for that day. Anybody else? Yeah. Like, come Lord Jesus, come. It's going to be an, an amazing moment when we are caught up in the air to meet him in the skies. He says, we ask you, brothers, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by some prophecy, report, or letter supposed to have come from us. In fact, they were forging letters to these people saying, this came from Paul, saying, this, uh, saying that the day of the Lord has already come. That hasn't happened. He says, don't let anyone deceive you in any way. For that day, that day of the Lord, the returning of the Lord, will not come until the rebellion occurs. And the man of lawlessness, also known as what, guys? The Antichrist, is revealed. The man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped, so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. And that's a bold and audacious claim he's going to make. And we'll talk about that here in a second to review. Verse 5, don't, don't you remember that when I was with you, I used to tell you these things. And now you know what is holding him back, the Antichrist, so, so that he may be revealed at the proper time. For the secret work of lawlessness, or secret power of, of lawlessness, is already at work. But the one who now holds it back will continue to do so until he's taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. I love that verse. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with the work of Satan, displayed in all kinds of counterfeit miracles and signs and wonders, and in every sort of evil that deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. And for this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie and so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth but have delighted in wickedness. And that is our text for this morning. Now, as we look at the, the future uh, here, as we're going to look at this, I said there's going to be four key questions we're going to look at. The first question and we're going to look at it is what is the future of the antichrist we're going to just start with him we're going to get him out of the way um, because we don't need to linger long uh, well we're going to talk about it for a while but uh it's not the ending point as we look at the future he, he's just a, a a piece of the story so what is the future of the antichrist and, and as we looked at this uh this passage there was a key event we talked about last week but I, I have to we have to talk about it again this week just to make sure it's there on the table he's going to do some key things and and one major one that came up in verse four is he will set himself up as god where in the temple, in the Jewish temple in Jerusalem, which right now is not even standing. It's been gone for 2,000 years. It's going to be rebuilt at some point. And when it does, look out, because that is a major uh, event keying the, the building up of the Antichrist. So this is a major event. When, when the, uh, it's a defining event that's going to happen, that the Antichrist will set himself up as God, proclaim himself to be God over all other so-called gods, over anything that's worshipped. He will say, I am the one who you are supposed to worship. And this event, uh, of course, he'll be building up to this. He'll already have been uniting world governments together. He'll already be uh, pulling uh, things together. And then this is kind of uh, a, a moment where he's been friendly to Israel. But this point in Jerusalem, in the temple, will completely defile and desecrate the temple it's called the abomination that causes desolation. It's found in Daniel and, and Matthew and in Revelation. This is a key event to be watching for. And he will want everyone to worship him. Now, building on top of that, 
when will this happen? Well, he'll be revealed at the proper time, it says. There's the spirit of lawlessness already at work, uh, but at some point when the restrainer is taken away, it's like the seatbelt on the Antichrist, when he's taken away, then this will happen. Now, last week we pointed out, this is also review here from last week, that, um, that this shows that God is in control, right? This, God's the one who's gonna, gonna choose the timing. He's the one who's going to choose when this will all happen and how the events are going on. So keep that in mind as we go into this. But what I didn't do last week was show you a little bit of a chart of a timeline. And I think this will be helpful for your understanding uh, as we talk about this and of some of the future questions we're going to look at. So here on this chart right here, on the left-hand side, you see that we start with what? The cross. That's the time of Jesus's uh, life and death and resurrection on earth. And after that, there was born... The church, uh, this era that we've lived in now for the last 2,000 years. So while it looks like a little blank span, uh, it's gone on for 2,000 years. So so events are not to scale, if I could say it that way. Um, But here then we will come upon the start of the tribulation, the great tribulation. This is where the Antichrist will really come onto the scene at the start of these seven years. Uh, we, we find these seven years prophesied in, in Daniel chapter 7, uh, Daniel chapter 9. Uh, we see it in Revelation 13. Uh, there's, there's this talk of, of the great tribulation. Jesus even specifically mentions it in Matthew chapter 24. What does the word tribulation mean? It, it means trouble. It means suffering. It's going to be a time of incredible suffering that's going to happen uh, on earth. And God will begin to pour out his judgments upon our earth. Has anybody read in the book of Revelation, there's, there's seven seals, seven trumpets, and seven bowls? Have, have you heard of that before? Have you read that before? Th- this is where God's going to begin to pour out these judgments upon the earth, and they're going to accelerate through the tribulation in those seven years. And lots of people are going to suffer, people are going to die, but on the good news, millions of people will be turning to faith in Christ during those seven years. It's going to be like a world revival that's going to happen, not, not, not the whole world, but throughout the world, there will be millions of people coming to faith in Christ And after that seven years is over, uh, Jesus is going to come back. He's going to uh, bring his full judgment on the earth. He's going to bring all of his believers uh, with him, his people. And he's going to set up a kingdom on earth that's going to be called the millennial kingdom. Thousand year reign of Christ. This is talked about in Revelation 20. So here's some homework for you. Uh, If you want to jot this down, go, go home this week and read Revelation 19, 20, 21, and 22. The last four chapters of the book of Revelation detail what's going to happen toward the end. And it's incredible. The victory that that God is going to bring is amazing. The the millennial kingdom is actually a reign of Christ on earth for a thousand years. Now, I don't know about you guys, but somehow I made it all the way through like middle school and high school years without really understanding what that meant. I had heard something about it. I, I got to college and they started teaching us this stuff and we're like, I was like, oh, so like literally... On earth, a thousand years? That's what Revelation says. And it's like, yeah. A thousand year reign on earth like it always should have been. Think like the Garden of Eden reinstituted. No sin. We're in our perfect resurrection bodies. Uh, Those who are with Christ are are only his his people. The evil is not with us at that point. And and we are living like heaven on earth. So a time is coming. (laughs) When we'll get to experience that. And after that thousand years, there's a final judgment. Uh, it goes on in Revelation 20 to talk about that. And then Revelation 21 and 22 talk about the new heavens and new earth that get created. And that's going to be even more amazing. So it just gets better and better for us. Now, here's a question. When will the Antichrist do what we just talked about, the abomination that causes desolation. When will it happen that, that he sets himself up to be God? He's been friendly with Israel for, for three and a half years, right smack in the middle of that tribulation. Right smack in the middle. That's, yeah, there we go. <laughs> Is the abomination in the temple. So he makes a treaty with Israel for these three and a half years. Everything is is on the outside kind of cool and calm. 
And then he sets himself up to be God. He desecrates the temple. And the next three and a half years just get absolutely crazy. The judgments are coming. Wars are happening. People are dying. And and the persecution against God's people is going to be incredible. For all the believers who are still left on the planet. And that's kind of vague for me right now because we're going to get to, will we be here? Will we not be here during that time? But that's what's going on. But what I want you to note is that's the Antichrist's lifespan, at least of his power, of his dominion, is seven years. He's on a leash, folks. It's not going to last forever. He's going to come to an end. So there's my next question. How will it end for the Antichrist, for, for him specifically? So let's look at that. He's going he's to die rather infamously in a battle. He has an end. And, and so what will happen? Well, we know from Revelation 19, that's part of your homework, to go home and read that. There's going to be a battle that the Antichrist is going to pull together all the kings and leaders of the earth. And he's going to assemble a mass army in Israel to fight against God and his people. Some people would refer to that battle as the battle of Armageddon. This is what's ramping up at the end of the tribulation. And so here he is, he's waging war, he's got all the kings of the earth. Can you imagine if you had all the firepower of all the major countries on earth? Like, think of the the tanks, think of the ships, the planes, the missiles, the nukes, the machine guns, the amount of troops. Uh, It's going to be an incredible massing of world a military power coming together. Revelation 19, it talk, talks about all these kings of the earth coming together under the leadership of the Antichrist. And we know, too, that the Antichrist has satanic power with him, don't we? It said that uh, earlier uh, here, in, that, that he's, got, he's got signs and wonders he can do. And so he's got all this power, all this satanic power uh, against uh, Jesus Christ. And then we read in 2 Thessalonians 2, Two chapter or verse eight that his end will come when Jesus returns and Jesus comes with his armies with them and what happens is this is this a long drawn out battle is there some some big war that there's casualties on both sides and it says he'll overthrow him by his breath <sighs> that's some powerful breath in a good way. <laughs> And by the splendor of his coming. The Antichrist won't be able to even stand. He's going to be completely destroyed and obliterated by the presence of Jesus Christ. We're going to look at that a little further in a future question. But think about how the Antichrist is so limited. In fact, as he dies and his whole army is with him, the whole satanic posse that he has is is gone, it's overthrown. It says in Revelation 19 that he gets thrown into the fiery lake of burning sulfur, and that's hell. And he's going to be there forever. That's the future of the Antichrist. As formidable and as powerful as he seems, he only has a short leash before Jesus takes him down. I'm glad to hear that. Because as much as the world can feel like it's out of control, as much as we might see these, these signs of evil happening around us and, and, and hints of the Antichrist, we know that all of this has an end. It has an expiration. And, and it won't even be a challenge for Jesus. He's never been out of control. He's never been afraid. He's never nervous. He has a plan for what's going to happen. Now let's move on to the next questions because I... I want to get going preaching about what's going to happen for us. Uh, So what's the future of the next group? Unbelievers. Those who haven't put their faith in Jesus Christ. Those who have not received him as Savior. What does this passage tell us about what's going to happen with them? I want to reread verses 9 through 12 with you. And we'll kind of stop at certain places here. It says, the coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with the work of Satan, displayed in all kinds of counterfeit miracles, signs, and wonders, and in every sort of evil that deceives those who are perishing. There's a phrase there. 
deceives those who are perishing. And it goes on to say they perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. And for this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion. I, I believe that's, that's the appearance of the Antichrist. It's, it's the, the power he has to deceive everyone so that they will believe the lie and they'll all be condemned who have not believed the truth but have delighted in wickedness. Folks, we've we got to spend some time thinking about this. Because the Antichrist is really just a, a tool in the hands of Satan, which is ultimately, if, since God is in control, it's a tool in the hands of, of God. And there are going to be people in our world, this is going to expose what's in their hearts. Do they follow the truth? Do they love the truth? Do they delight in Jesus? Do they delight in wickedness? And the scripture says that all who, who refuse the truth, all who delight in wickedness are going to be swept up into what is going on with the Antichrist. They're going to be deceived. They're going to follow after him. And their end is not good. Think about the millions and millions of people in our world who do not know Jesus Christ as Savior. Our, our country has over 350 million people. How many millions of people in the United States don't know Jesus Christ as Savior? It's a lot. We can't put a number to it. How many millions of people who are currently at the Paris Olympic Games don't know Jesus Christ as Savior? How many people on the various continents throughout the earth, the various countries from big cities to rural mountain villages don't know Jesus Christ as Savior? This is telling us that those who don't know him, those who have refused the truth are going to be swept into this and their judgment is going to be the same as the Antichrist. Now, it uses an interesting phrase. It says those who refuse the truth. God is continually revealing himself to our world. I love this about God. He, he, has, he has created this world, and people are the ones who have turned their backs upon him, but God is continually pursuing after people. In fact, Revelation chapter 1, or sorry, uh, Romans chapter 1, <laughs> I'm getting all confused in my prophetic books of the Bible. Uh, Romans chapter 1, it says that God has revealed himself in what he has made. His divine attributes, his divine qualities are, are seen so that people are without excuse. They know that God exists, whether they will admit it or not, whether they fully understand who he is or not. God is revealing himself in nature. That, that means there's not a person in this world, you, you could ask him, is there a God they should know in their hearts by what has been made? The answer is yes. There is a God. He's powerful, he's a creator, he's above me, I'm accountable to him. Romans chapter 2 tells us that every person is guilty of sin because they have a knowledge of the law of God. Whether it's from the fact that they have a Bible in their hands or they've been taught the Bible or whether it's even just in their consciences. It says that our consciences are a law to themselves. And if we break what we know is wrong, we have sinned. That means you could go to every person in the planet, the remotest village that you want to go to that's never heard of Jesus, and you could ask them, have you ever done something you knew was wrong? And every human being will have to answer, yes. Everyone knows that they've done wrong because God has revealed a right and a wrong, a morality to them in the world. We also know that God is revealing himself. In, in fact, it says... Uh, in Acts chapter 17, that, that God is allowing the peoples of the world to move to different places so that they might be in a place where they could reach out and they could find him. That he, he's, he's showing himself to the peoples of the world. That's why there's so much movement these days, so that there's more people that can hear about Jesus. We also know that he's commissioned us, his church, to go and to bring the good news to every nation on earth. And so his desire is that more and more people would come to know him as Savior, and yet, here he's saying there are people that will just refuse the truth. They will reject the truth of who Jesus Christ is. And at the judgment, it will be clear that people have delighted in wickedness. So when the Antichrist comes, while millions of people will recognize what's going on and 
And there'll be an amazing movement of people coming to faith in Christ. There'll, there'll be an amazing movement among the Jews of people coming to faith in Christ. And there's prophecies about that, that Israel will be saved. There's going to be amazing things that happen. The revealing of the Antichrist is going to be this dividing line in the sand. That you'll be able to tell, is this the one that we should follow? Or is Jesus Christ the one whom we should follow? And everyone will have to make a choice. There will be a clear contrast between them. And sadly, a majority of the world will choose to follow the Antichrist. They have, they've believed the delusion. They've believed the lie. It reveals what's in their heart. And so a judgment is coming against our world. Revelation 20 says that there's going to be this great white throne judgment. And every person will come before the Lord and all those who have not believed on him, it says, will be thrown into the lake of fire. The same location as the Antichrist. The same location, by the way, as, as Satan and all his demons. I used to work with a guy uh, back in college. I uh, worked at a factory. Everyone should work in a factory at some point in their life. It's a different uh, experience of humanity. There was, there was a guy in there who was the very vocal one who kept the culture of the workplace up, and he was the, 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 the funny commentary. And he would say very boldly, I'm going to hell in a handbasket. He would say it all the time. I remember thinking, well, I, I don't have anything clever to say back. Um, I don't know what to say. But hell's not going to be a party. He, in his mind, he's thinking, oh, I'm going to go there. It's going to be awesome because I'm going to be there. And, of course, if I'm going to be there, it's going to be awesome. And, and if Satan's there, he's running the place. It's going to be awesome. And I want to be part of that. Folks, Satan doesn't run the place. The demons don't run the place. Hell is a place of isolation, of darkness, of weeping, of gnashing of teeth. It's complete separation away from God forever. And if you're separated away from, from God, it's a separation away from anything good ever again for your complete existence. And you are, it's, it's a conscious torment in that place. That's the destination of all who will not receive Jesus Christ as Savior. All who will not believe. Folks, that's why the mission is so important. That's why we just commissioned a team to go to Portugal. Every year when they go, there are, there are a couple of students who receive Jesus Christ as Savior. There's a whole generation of those who are coming back year after year, getting discipled at this camp, and are getting connected to, to churches, as few churches as there are in Portugal, and they're, they're getting discipled. There are, there are ones who have been going to that camp for, for 10 years, who have grown through that, who have gotten married to another Christian, and have now started Christian families, and it's changing a, a start of a, a whole new generation of believers in Portugal. And that's the dream. That's the vision. That's why we do that stuff. It might be slow going. Satan might be trying to blind people. He, he's going to try everything he can to stop that kind of thing, but we're praying, and we're sending, and we're going. That's why we send a team to Chicago. That's why we partner with people uh, that we send all over the world. That's why we go to our neighbors. That's why we go to our friends. We are all sent every day. Oh, that we would love Christ. Oh, that we would let the life of Christ flow into us and through us. Oh, that we would shine brightly for Christ. Oh, that we would share Christ because the world needs to know and the more that can know him now, the more can be spared from what's coming in the future. It's so important. The future of the world is in the balance. The future of souls is in the balance. And God's given us a mission to reach them. So we move to our next question. What's the future of believers? <laughs> Those who have trusted in Christ. What's going to happen to us in the end there when, when the tribulation happens and when, when the Antichrist has risen to power? And I want to answer this question with two layers. One is a timeline question and one is a heart question. The first one is, is timeline, and I know that this is one you guys want to see, so I'm going to put it up first, and we're going, to, we're going to talk about this. We talked about how we're going to be raptured at some point. 
We're going to be taken out of this earth. All those who are believers in Christ are going to be taken up into the sky to meet Jesus. When does that happen? Will we be going through the tribulation or not? So, I'm going to give you some options. (laughs) Option number one is called pre-tribulation rapture. There, there's a rapture where, where Jesus comes back, but, but not in the visible full way where everything goes on. It, it's kind of a, they call it like a, like a secret coming of Jesus. It's not like the world sees him. They, they just notice all of a sudden that all the believers are just instantly gone. Like they're driving a car and, and then poof, they're gone and, and the car crashes. And like imagine if, if this is the case. Uh, this is what the Left Behind books uh, say. They talk about like an, on an airplane and people like vanish off the airplane. Their clothes are like laying there and people are like, <gasps> like what happened? Like imagine the world crisis that will come if this is what happens. It, it's, the church is gone. They're taken out away. And, and that kicks off a world crisis, which is not hard to believe. Then that opens the door for the Antichrist to come to power and, and for uh, for, for people to start thinking stuff is really weird and they're trying to gravitate towards something that's stable and, and he's bringing all this together. That's kind of the, the thought there in the tribulation or in the pre-tribulation rapture. There's a couple of, of key prophecies that, that people will point to uh, to believe, uh, to, to pull together this, this viewpoint. Uh, there's a, a scripture or two that seem to, to say that Christians will not suffer the wrath of God. Now, does that mean the wrath of God in hell, or does that mean the wrath of God during the tribulation? And they would interpret that to say, we think that's during the tribulation. Uh, Another thing that they point to is that throughout Scripture, it says Jesus is coming like a thief in the night. You don't know when it's going to be. And if if the tribulation, or if the rapture is after uh, the tribulation, wouldn't you see all those events happening? And it's not going to be very sudden. You're going to know it's coming. So it has to be before the tribulation. And, and those are, uh, that's a quick summary. You can read a whole lot more. There's books and books written about this, but just so you know, that, that's one view. Another view would be that Jesus will come back in the middle of the tribulation. That's called mid tribulation rapture. Uh, that this whole talk of three and a half years, there's a covenant, then three and a half years, it's, it's broken. Uh, and, and they would point to this passage, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, to, to say that's what Paul's argument is. He's saying this isn't going to happen. You're not going to be taken away until you see the man of lawlessness come on the scene. And so they would say well, it's going to happen right in, in the middle of the, of the tribulation. There are uh, people who, who have taught this uh, over the years. It's not as popular anymore. A uh, hundred years ago, it was a lot more popular. Uh, in fact, A.B. Simpson, the founder of the Christian Missionary Alliance, at uh, some point on his journey, believed that and wrote about a mid-tribulation uh, rapture. Um, everybody can kind of be on a journey with this. This is not a make it or break it to your faith to have this all nailed down. So if you can change your positions. You can be studying this. It's okay. Um, but that was mid-tribulation. Or is the rapture post-tribulation, after the tribulation? And these people would say, well, it makes sense that we'll be raptured uh, when Jesus comes back and it's all going to be one big event. His return is the visible return. It's when we're caught up in the air to meet him and the judgment happens and we come down and the millennial kingdom happens and it's one big event, the day of the Lord idea. And so they would say that makes more sense in terms of all the prophecies. It's a simpler kind of interpretation. Now, I had a professor in college who, uh, would, who he said, um, after teaching on all this, he had, the, he had this voice like this. And uh, <laughs> he, he said, my view is post-tribulation rapture. And uh, he, you know, he, he said, I want to be ready for, I won't continue on his voice. Um, I, I want to be ready if I have to go through the tribulation. And there's a point to what he's saying that, We need to be prepared in case we don't fully understand all this stuff to go through whatever we're going to have to face as believers. If it happens in our generation, are we ready to suffer? Are we we ready to see the kind of losses and and cataclysmic events that would happen on earth? Are are we ready to have the kind of persecution where the the Antichrist is going to try to force us to worship him and and, and he's got a a number, the mark of the beast, 666, that we're supposed to take and what does that even mean? What's it going to be? We don't even know yet and people have had guesses all through the years and still don't know yet but are we going to even recognize what's going to happen? His point was, 
I need to prepare myself that if I'm alive during that time, I need to be willing to go through it. If my life ends during that time, that, hey, great, bonus, I get to go to heaven earlier, right? What, you, you can take my body, but you can never kill the soul. I, I, I know where I'm at with Jesus. But then he said, and I will use his voice, he goes, but if I'm wrong, then I'll repent all the way up. And he's like, if it's a pre-tribulation rapture, then he's like, sweet, I don't have to deal with this. So he's like, I'm going to repent. Jesus, my view was wrong. And, and like, whew, he's going up with the Lord, and, and he's going to be happy and excited that he doesn't have to go through the tribulation. So th- that was his reasoning. Do you guys want to know my opinion? Okay, so my view is something that I would call pan-tribulation. It's all going to pan out in the end. <laughs> and now you're going to be stuck with that. I'm not giving you any more. Uh, but one note is whether the believers are raptured out before the tribulation or not, there will be Christians who have to go through the tribulation. If the, if the church is raptured out at the beginning, we know that there are going to be hundreds and thousands and perhaps millions of people that will come to Christ during that time. And we'll have to live during those seven years. And they're going to have to be prepared to go through it as well. But I I wonder if it's going to be that much, because it'll be so obvious to Christians, if we'll just be that much more ready to go through it. Because we'll know that we know that we know that we're on the winning side. Wouldn't that be wonderful to just have the assurance, like, this is all playing out. Like Jesus said, this has to be true. And I'm going to stake my whole life on it. Won't that be an amazing position for Christians who are seeing it happen in real time in history? Now, a heart heart answer to this question. What will be the future of believers? Last week, we we read from Revelation 13, and it was talking about the Antichrist, the, the beast, and all of that. And it said that all whose names are not written in the Lamb's book of life will worship him. They're going to follow the Antichrist. But the implication is that those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life will stay faithful. They'll stay true. They're going to endure to the end. What's the future of believers? Isn't it incredible that in heaven there's a book with the names of every person who's received Jesus as Savior. If you know Jesus as Savior, your name is there. I don't know what page it's on. Maybe one day you're going to get to flip through that book and see. I don't, I don't know what the handwriting is like. I don't know what language it is, some heavenly language. I don't know what the ink is. I mean, it's the Lamb's book. It's the picture of Jesus and the blood that was shed by the perfect spotless Lamb for your forgiveness of your sins. Maybe it's written in his blood. You're that precious to him. He loves you that much that he's got your name written down and you're his. What's the future of believers? When you die or when you are raptured, you're gonna go into the presence of the Lord and he's gonna be like, Yep, you're mine. You're you're mine. Welcome now into my presence for all eternity. Well done, my good and faithful servant. I'm ready to hear those words. I'm going to live as faithfully as I can now, and I'm going to be about his business, and I'm going to try to walk with him as faithfully as I can. But I'm already secure. (laughs) My name's written in his book. And I'm going to be with them forever. So don't fear. Don't wonder. If you have received Christ as Savior, he he was after you long before you were after him. And he's got you. And you're his. And now I want to talk about my favorite part of this message. As good as this last one was. What's the future of Jesus? He's God. So his future is pretty secure. But let's tease that out a little bit. You know, I said earlier that Jesus has never once been out of control. He's never once been nervous. 
even when we are. He's never been afraid. He's never wondered what's going to happen next. He's fully in control, even when the events of this world are going to spiral out of control. And all of that is going to happen in a way that just gives him more glory. How do I know that? Do you remember what happened when Jesus was on the earth the first time? In his first coming, the world was against him. People were out to get him. There was sinfulness in the world. Satan was using different people to try to trap him and then finally to stir up the crowd to to convict him. And, And he ended up even being betrayed by his close friend who, by the way, was under the full influence of Satan, it says in Scripture. Satan wanted Jesus dead. And Jesus died. But was Jesus out of control? Nope. It fully played into his plan that then Jesus died as the perfect substitute for all of mankind. And his blood was shed for us. Even though Satan was the pawn making it happen, it played right into the hand of God and then he rose from the dead and conquered sin and Satan and death and it opened up the way of salvation for all the world. So what do you think is going to happen at his second coming? Doesn't it stand to reason that everything that happens is just going to play into his hand and is going to give him more glory? Aren't we going to see the amazing power and authority of Jesus on display like never before? Aren't millions and millions of people going to come to faith in Jesus? Aren't the hearts of every believer going to rejoice that the one who's been against us, the one who's been, been fighting us, the one who's just had stirred up evil all around us is finally fully vanquished. He's already defeated, but he's going to be fully vanquished on that day. And if he's ever robbed something of you, if he's ever stolen your joy, if he's ever hurt you or abused you or anyone else that you love, isn't it going to be amazing when you see the full downfall of Satan and the Antichrist and every part of evil on earth? it's going to be an amazing day when the glory of Jesus Christ is revealed and his full kingdom comes on earth and he heals every wound and he welcomes us home and we're in his presence with no more conflict inside of us, no more conflict in the world, full justice restored for every wrong that's ever been committed. We're going to live in the perfection of the kingdom of the King of kings and the Lord of lords. By the way, if you go home and read Revelation 19, it talks a little bit more about Jesus and his victory. It says that when he comes back, he's going to come riding on a white horse, which symbolizes his victory. His robe's going to be dipped in blood, perhaps the blood of the lamb that was shed for the world. His, he's going to have on his head many crowns. And on his thigh, there's going to be a tattoo. Yes, <laughs> at least written. doesn't use the word tattoo, but written on his thigh. King of kings and Lord of lords. And that's the place of power in the ancient day. And he's going to be coming with all the armies of heaven, eyes blazing, and he's going to be swooping down to the earth. And it says that as he comes to those armies at the Battle of Armageddon, there's going to be a sword coming out of his mouth, which is the word of God. And I believe that gives more context to what's being said here in 2 Thessalonians 2 about his breath. The same word that as he spoke, universes came into being. Galaxies and stars, the world, the clouds, the water, the land, the animals, you and me. He spoke us into existence. If he can do that, if he could breathe upon his disciples when when he commissioned them and said, go in the power of the Holy Spirit, and he breathed on them, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. If he can do that kind of thing with just the word of his mouth, imagine what he's going to do when he speaks victory over the armies at the the battle of Armageddon and they all literally in a moment, they fall over dead. Look at the power of Jesus Christ. Look at the glory of Jesus Christ. Look at the dominion of Jesus Christ. What's his future? He reigns above it all. Now when you read that scripture that says, 
at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. There will be no other option to the glory of God the Father. What an amazing Savior. What an amazing King. Folks, don't fear the end. Don't, don't be obsessed about, oh, what's this mean? And what's this detail going to be like? And what's, what's going to happen with this leader? And oh, did you see that happen on the news? We need to be aware. We need to be watching. We need to be praying. But we need to be excited. There's a moment when all this is going to end and we're going to be face to face with Jesus. Oh, what a day that will be. Don't fix your eyes on Satan. Don't fix your eyes on the Antichrist. Fix your eyes on Jesus. May this be an encouragement to you. Wherever you are in your walk, may, may you know that if you have Christ, you're on the winning side. And you've got him, and he's got you forever and ever. I'd like to invite you out of reverence to, to Jesus Christ in this moment to stand. We're going we're to sing praise to him. I want to pray over us. I want you to pray. If you've heard this news, this is the gospel. This is the good news. And in your heart, by a response of faith, I just want to invite you here in this, make this a holy moment. Jesus, you're here. You're with us in this room. What do you need to say to the Lord? Just exclaim it in your heart to him. Jesus, we exalt you. We glorify your name. We're not worthy except that the blood of the Lamb was shed for us and you have counted us worthy, though we don't deserve it. And we long for the full victory that's coming one day. What a glorious future. Lord, encourage our hearts now. And as we sing these words, Lord, would you be exalted in this room from every heart, from every mouth. Would this be a throne you can sit upon as you reign over this world today? Amen.
You reign above it all. You reign above it all. Over the universe and over every heart. There is no higher thing. Jesus, you reign above it all. For all of heaven and the earth are all just stars. His power and his peace and his blessing. God bless you. You're dismissed.